Ken Gioli told uh, Mendel Botnick that if he wanted to get a uh, history of the uh, Fairfax Hospital, and I guess eventually the Nova system, that he should speak to some of the RODs. RRODs. Yeah, really old doctors. Really, really old doctors. <laughs> This hospital was built out here no, in the middle of nowhere. This was just a, a narrow two-lane road through the sw swamps from here to, to uh, Route 50. I don't think Tyson's Corner existed as Tyson's Corner. It, 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 if I remember correctly, it was, there was just a few stores there, and they were like a general store. And, and I thought, God, this is really out in the country. I, I don't know how viable this is. Locals were even kind of laughing about having a hospital out here, locals primarily from Arlington County and Alexandria. It was a field of dreams of hospitals. Build it, and they would come. But we didn't realize there'd be so many. The day the hospital was to open, uh, they were having a ribbon cutting around, oh, 10 o'clock. And before even they could open the hospital, a pregnant woman in labor showed up and they had to open the hospital soon. We were all very excited and of course she got great attention. And then I got a call, uh, would I please go down to the front, of, front lobby because the opening was starting and all the other head nurses are there except you. So I said, well, I'm sorry, I've got a patient here and I feel that I ought to stay. And then she hung up on me, didn't like it. It was not all that thoughtful of the uh, uh, of the ba of the baby to uh, to test the system out ahead of time. When the hospital opened in 1961, of course they asked us uh, to um, to cover the hospital on a daily basis as a volunteer. There, there just was no calling to have emergency room physicians full time. There were no interns, no residents. No fellows, no nothing. The only people working in the hospital were we, private physicians, who were donating our time to the hospital to make sure it was functioning. We stayed in the hospital and the emergency room was open. We were waiting for patients. And, it was, and uh, we waited and we waited and we waited. I was here to take care of new admissions. And during this 24 hours, there was no, no one admitted. And I said, my gosh, the people can't find this place. <laughs> and that proved to be very wrong. In the late 60s, there was a terrible snowstorm here. It closed everything. But there was one administrator that got here by skis, and that was Dick Foster. One of the early uh, duties that we uh, had was actually fundraising all of the monies for staffing the hospital, purchasing supplies, uh, had to come from uh, what was then called Fairfax Hospital Association. The real credit behind the formation of the Fairfax Hospital Association goes to Grace Lucas. Before Frank was hired, or right after he was hired, but before he came on board, he went over to Grace's house and they sat down at her kitchen table and he went through the whole, his whole plan or his whole vision for what would be in Fairfax County. When I started anyway, it was a budget of $4 million a year. Now it's a little bit higher than that now I think. Frank Imes was the administrator. He was a man of exceptional vision. He foresaw the future. He definitely had a vision to grow it into a multi-hospital system. 
I think that he would be pleased with what has happened today. One of the things I think that's made Fairfax Hospital is the doctors, especially as in those early days. We were adrenaline junkies. I worked the, the literal moonlight shift, which was from 11 to 7. I remember that quite well. I also remember, um, unfortunately or fortunately, the salary I was paid. We, we sort of took uh, pride in our uh, servitude. In, in those days, it was somewhat of a badge of honor, so how long you could go without sleep. We, the pathologist, particularly several of us, uh, did bone marrow aspirations and things like that at that time. At that time, there were no hematologists, so we were the hematologists. I did internal medicine, mostly family practice. I did a lot of OBs. I did a lot of tonsil work. Uh, I did a lot of things that all the family doctors did in those days. We did the radio new, radioisotope works or, or the uh, nuclear medicine in this hospital. And then uh, after a period of time, you, the pathologist in general didn't train in nuclear medicine. I did OB because I liked it. It was the only part of my practice that I ever had a happy result, a little baby. Nothing else gave me that joy, nothing. Yeah, now we have all these super specialists. A patient with severe rheumatoid arthritis uh, back in the 1970s could be hospitalized for a week, insurance companies would pay for it, and simply bed rest and getting out of stressful home environments and some TLC and some medication uh, usually help them a great deal. We started their own blood donor center, and it's grown to quite a big center. I think we're drawing, they're drawing over 100,000 units a year at this time. Uh, at one time, I was the chairman of the Infectious Disease Committee. Well, I was on the head of that committee when we first had an inspection control officer. She worked half time. She was a lab technician. I don't know what they have now, but I imagine it's quite a bit more. Not only were we fortunate in getting very well trained, certified specialists here, but we had a marvelous group of nurses. We were really a family because we knew a lot about the doctors and their family, their wives. Some of the wives came in and had babies and um, we just, we were just friends really because it was just a small group. In the early 70s is when pantsuits came into being for the nurses and uh, nurses started wearing pants and it was really nice and Sarah Tatum made a comment that my head nurses will not wear pants. And we were that way for several weeks until she showed up at work in a pantsuit. So we all went together and wore pants one day and nothing was said and from then on it was okay. On the Sundays or the weekends that I was working, I usually brought my family in and uh, we would eat in the cafeteria and you'd see people like Dr. Krim. <laughs> If you go down the cafeteria now, you cannot imagine that saying to your spouse, let's go to the hospital <laughs> to have dinner on Sunday and take the kids. The cafeteria was a lot smaller, but we used to get things every once in a while like steak, lobster tails. <laughs> the wives knew each other. Uh, and, and what we would, and we'd have that time with the families visiting. And then we'd say, oh, wait a minute, I've got a couple patients upstairs to see. Because the atmosphere was so collegial, the, uh, if you needed assistance in your specialty, it was available. There's no uh, turf battles or things like that. It was, every, everything was uh, ideal. You knew not only the staff you worked with, but the doctors, the housekeepers, uh, the engineering people. It was really, it was, it was really, not that it's not now, but it was really back then a really neat place to work. It was a place that I loved, and I must say, I can, I can say that in all my years, I think the days there were the, some of the happiest of my life. I had the most wonderful medical staff and the wonderful nursing staff. To me, it's been wonderful. 
I, I owe a big debt of gratitude to this hospital, not only for my uh, being a physician here, but also for what it's done for my personal family, for my wife, for my father, and uh, for my son. I think it has been one of the great uh, benefits of living in not just Fairfax, but Northern Virginia. We deal with such serious things, and some of these lighter things in our lives just are wonderful to, to, to recollect, and they, they just should never be forgotten.